Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we want to kick off our orbital research. We have a lot of little things we have to do in order to make that successful. We're also going to be building a passively cooled steam vent tamer. We're also running into another problem. We've completely ran out of sulfur, which fear not, not a huge deal, because we do have a ton of sulfur sitting over here on Takarini. Now, the disadvantage here is this pool of water is still being actively cooled by this thermoregulator. I'm not willing to give up on this thermoregulator yet. I kind of wish we had more than 14 cycles remaining because the problem is we still have a bunch of hot sulfur in here. This stack here is at 80 to 90 degrees. This 55 tons here is at 101. So this sulfur here is still heating up this water. So it's taking everything the thermoregulator can do. I think eventually it will normalize. But to help that along, we're putting a backup system in place. Remember, if you will, our crude oil that we dropped right over this metal tile and we have the radiant gas pipe that this thermoregulator is keeping cool. This crude oil is down to 15 degrees. So what we're actually gonna do is take our supply teleporter output and connect it to that little pool. We've already got the rails coming all the way down they're finishing up being constructed. And so all we really need to do is throw a conveyor chute in here. Copper is fine. Connect it with the conveyor rail. And then we can dump all of that hot sulfur into this pool. Now we're gonna use the method of averaging. And this is what I mean. The first thing we're gonna do is throw the coolest sulfur in there, hoping that it'll be able to cool down even further. Once it's in there, and let's say it gets down to 20 degrees, we can then throw a hotter stack of sulfur on it. And when we do, the stacks, when they combine, will actually average out the difference. Remember, it's not like we're picking up 50 tons all at once. We're only picking up a little bit at a time, throwing it in the conveyor loader, and then having it ride the rails. And it looks like the rail system is completed, so I think we're ready to actually scoop some up. We'll start by sweeping up this little bit here. We have the conveyor loader set on sweep only. And even riding the rails, it actually cools the sulfur down a little bit. We don't want to be dumping too much of that hot temperature in here. At least it'll arrive at Shrabera a little bit cooler. Now we're having a little bit of power issues. It's not a big deal. It's just the function of being on manual generators. Because this thermoregulator is taking a lot of power, well, the dupe's got to sleep sometimes. So we typically run out of a little bit of power. But after a little while, the dupes start running again and we're doing just fine. And now that we have that set up, we can just pull 80 kilos at a time from this huge pile. It's 86 degrees going in. And as it reaches the supply teleporter, it's around 50 degrees. And once it wakes its way through Shrabera, it comes and hits this area. And so it looks like it's going to hover around 47 to start with until the small cooling system has an opportunity to catch up and start working. But the important thing to note is now that we have a stack in here that's at 47 degrees, it doesn't matter the temperature that it comes in here at. It'll average those two temperatures out based on the size. Long story short, we're going to be just fine. But now for the mission at hand, and that's to get this orbital micro lab into space so we can start doing that orbital research. Before we start that, I wanted to take a moment to give a shout out to the comments. We we're able to see that our latrine here, or our washroom, wasn't 12 tiles. And that's the reason we weren't getting the bonus. As soon as I expanded it to 12 tiles, we then started getting the washroom room bonus. All we had to really sacrifice was the pictures up here and just move the barracks up one. Also, if you remember, we had to load up our wall toilet with water. And we did that using our beautiful access tunnel. Now we have a water pipe coming from our geysers. And whenever this rocket lands, it'll fill all the pipes on the interior up with water. So basically, when this rocket takes off, this is the amount of water it's going to have to run this wall toilet. It should be plenty of cycles worth. If not, we reland. And as soon as we land, this liquid pipe gets reconnected and fills back up. We have 10 kilos of grub fruit preserve being loaded in this refrigerator. Gives us about 25 cycles worth. We have 20 tons of plastic ready to go. So I think we're actually ready. 
except for one minor problem. I thought we had more oxalite than 42 kilos. Now the oxalite that we had was enough to provide oxygen for this interior for now, but once we have a duplicate living in here, well, I'm afraid 42 kilos is not going to be enough. So your next question might be, well, why don't we just build an oxalite refinery? Well, the problem is neither of our starting planetoids have access to gold. There's none on Shrubera, and there's none on Takarini. So until we get to a planetoid with some gold that we can bring home, I'm afraid there's no oxalite refining in our future, which is going to present some problems. Not only for rocket interiors and off-gassing that beautiful oxygen, but also we're not going to have any oxalite to use as oxidizer. This kind of narrows it down for us, so long story short, I believe we're going to have to stay with Radbolt rockets. After, of course, we try out our beautiful sugar engine. We are still waiting for some fertilizer. Because right now, all of our fertilizer is being used for our beautiful grub fruit farm. But we can fix that for a little while and just stop fertilizing crops. So in order to fix that, we're just going to disable all four of these buildings. And that way, they won't bring any fertilizer to them. Once our rocket oxalite tank is filled with fertilizer, we can reactivate the farm stations. But because these fertilizer synthesizers only produce 120 grams per second, we just don't have enough to do both at the same time. So that's why we switched over to an oxygen diffuser and started loading the storage bin up with algae. Once we have plenty of algae loaded up into the storage bin, we'll be ready to launch. In the meantime, another shout out to the comments. It was correctly noticed that these were not filled in. There's no background on any of these tiles, so we're actually losing quite a bit of oxygen. Definitely some eagle eyes there. But we'll just fill it in with some beautiful drywall and be done with that. All right, we've got 210 kilos worth of fertilizer loaded up, which is enough to give us two tiles worth of range. Hey, that's all we really need. All we're doing is going to orbit, doing all of our research, and then coming back. We have 7.5 tons of algae loaded up, 20 cycles worth of food. We have all the water we need. We're ready to go. And Ada here is going to be our orbital researcher and pilot. Now, she's not going to be the greatest at science because she wasn't our primary scientist when we were doing all the earlier research. But she has a science of four, and we've pretty much done everything else beforehand. So all that's left to do is the orbital research. We will switch over to our crew designation, select ADA, select our destination, and it even says trip distance, just a half a tile. This is a change they made in the recent patch. It used to be to get to orbit and come right back didn't actually take any fuel. Well, they've fix that exploit. Here comes Ada now. Only thing we need to make sure is that she's allowed to do research. Because remember, in our colony, by default, they weren't. And we are ready for launch. And the inaugural launch of the Shunger engine. Now, Ada is already doing what might be the most adorable animation in the entire game, but we cannot forget to unequip that suit. Oh, we made a mistake. We didn't connect the oxygen diffuser. I know what we can do. What we're going to do is actually remove the refrigerator from the power source. Not too bad. It's loaded up with grub fruit preserve. And grub fruit preserve naturally just takes 32 cycles to spoil anyways. So whenever you're ready to get off the phone, Ada, and get to work, that'd be great. And now we have enough power line to connect our oxygen diffuser. One of the amazing things about the wall toilet is it only takes 2.5 kilos of water per flush. And each liquid pipe holds 10 kilos. This is going to be plenty of water for all the flushing needs that Ada has. And look at this. We have some orbital research finally finished. Hydrocarbon propulsion. And now we just move down the line. With orbital research underway... I wanted to tap in to this cool steam vent. Now remember, this steam's gonna come out at 110 degrees. Not exactly ideal for our beautiful battery box. For this battery box to stay chill, we need to do something because eventually it will melt all of this ice and start heating up. We're actually gonna tap into the anti-entropy thermo nullifier. That's a mouthful. By piping hydrogen into here, it'll actually just keep the surrounding area cool and continuously just put chill into the air. And we just so happen to have plenty of hydrogen that we're not using in our oxygen centers. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to add a nice little gas bridge here that prioritizes sending the hydrogen up here when it can, and then send the rest right up here. But what does that have to do with the cool steam vent? Well, I've got another dumb idea. And here it is. We have radiant gas pipes that filter through this chamber. They're made out of steel because, well, they're the best radiant gas pipes that we have access to. And what's beautiful about this system is it's picking up the chill from over here at the anti-entropy thermo nullifier. We again use steel radiant gas pipes to pick up chill. It brings it all the way down here and drops that chill off. So when this cool steam vent finally erupts in 34 cycles, this little ice box here is going to be cold enough where that steam is going to instantly turn into water. And we're going to leave it there until this hydro sensor will say above one kilo senses that there's water on it. And then the liquid pump will bring it out. And where's it going? Well, straight down to our main water supply. We also have it connected to the hydro sensor. That way the liquid vent can shut off flow if the need ever requires. Small, simple system. That should work out just fine. Once the dupes get all these pipes finished, we'll be able to seal it in and hopefully forget about it. I did want to mention that there's a very important piece to that, and that's this gas pipe. Once you get the hydrogen in here, you have to have this gas pipe to tell the hydrogen which way to flow. There's no gas pump or anything. It's just passive cooling using the thermo nullifier. And the great thing about this passive cooling solution is it requires zero power. The anti-entropy thermo nullifier, there's that mouthful again, doesn't take anything other than hydrogen. It uses 10 grams a second and removes 80,000 DTUs worth of heat from the environment. Quick update on Ada. This rocket interior is just working out so well. The only thing that we might have done a little different is, well, A, wire up both the refrigerator and the oxygen diffuser, but also put in a sort of filtration system. What you can do is you can make room for a small gas pump and connect that gas pump to a filter, whether a passive filter or an active one, and have it siphon out the carbon dioxide. If it ends up being carbon dioxide, it just gets stored in a bunch of ventilation shafts until you get back to the spaceport, and then you can dump all that carbon dioxide. In fact, why don't we send out a home, clean this up a little bit, and put that system into action? Something I wanted to point out, now that the rocket's returned, the water is going to now fill back in and refill the whole thing. And now we're just going to make a couple of changes. First, we're actually going to lose the flower pot. And we're going to put the refrigerator up here where the flower pot is, which means we don't need those wires there. So we can send it over here and then add our refrigerator back. Now for our filtration system, we're going to start with the gas vent on the outside of the spacefarer module. And it's simply connected to the output pipe. And here's our revised system. We're going to take this gas element sensor set it to carbon dioxide. So whenever this sensor detects carbon dioxide, this pump is going to start picking up all of the gases around it. Sometimes it's going to be oxygen. Sometimes it's going to be carbon dioxide. If it is oxygen, it comes right out and gets thrown out this vent. If it's carbon dioxide, it takes the long road back to this vent. Now, while the rocket's in space, it's not going to be able to vent out. The amount of carbon dioxide in here is only 10 grams. Considering that every single gas pipe here can hold a thousand grams, we are not at risk for this whole system to get backed up. Speaking of backed up, earlier we put a gas bridge right here, which prioritized all of the hydrogen going towards the anti-entropy thermo nullifier. Well, what would happen is the packets would get stuck here and here because they were trying to go up this gas pipe, which means this line here got backed up. So we got rid of the gas bridge and just let it go 50-50 split, and it is plenty of hydrogen for the nullifier. You might be saying, that's a lot of power draw for only one single battery and one wheel. Well, it's actually not too bad. The gas filter is actually our heaviest consumer because it'll run pretty consistently as long as there's carbon dioxide sitting down there. The refrigerator actually only uses 20 watts the majority of the time. And that's because it goes down to 20 watts in energy saver mode. Energy saver mode is activated whenever the food inside goes below two degrees because the target temperature for a refrigerator is one degree. It'll only use 120 watts 
briefly after the dupe opens the door. Then we have the oxygen diffuser, which is going to hit max gas pressure all the time. It'll only be using 120 watts whenever it needs to supply a little bit more oxygen. That's not going to happen too often. The orbital micro lab is 60 watts, and then our party line phone is 120 watts. But again, that's only when the party line phone is being used. Once we get it back up into space, we'll take a look at the power draw and see how it is. But it's not going to be too bad. I noticed I had messed up putting in the mini gas pump. I had it flipped. It's now actually pumping a lot more of the carbon dioxide out a lot quicker. Instead of barely getting it at 10 grams a pop, it's now pulling carbon dioxide a lot more effectively from this tile here. Because I'm sure it still has the same cross pattern of where it will actually pull the gases from. But I think it's time to finally get Ada back up into space to continue that research. And we're go for launch again. In case you were curious, the sugar engine exhausts carbon dioxide. Well, really hot carbon dioxide. Almost 1600 degrees at some spots. Here's 1750. Oh, wow. 2500 degrees of carbon dioxide right here which actually superheats our little access tunnel for a minute. But it's not a problem because we used obsidian directly under the rocket. So Ada's back in space, and our current load stays between 200 and 260. It's not too shabby. It even goes as low as 60 at times and as high as 320, but it's a very reasonable load. Ada only has to run on the wheel once or twice per cycle. Completely maintainable, especially considering all the built-in features this interior has. But now for another conversation. I think this may be the last episode in the Dupe Only Power series. Now, before you go get your britches in a bunch, let me explain why. I think we've proven that you can run a fairly successful colony using Dupe Only Power. We haven't had power issues in quite some time. We are fully sustainable. We have all of the oxygen requirements knocked out. We have the food requirements knocked out. But it's actually the limitation of what that means by running dupe only power that kind of got to me. We found this beautiful minor volcano and well, there's not much we can do with it. With minor volcanoes, you normally like to strap them on steam turbines to provide some geothermal power. Maybe using that magma, turning it into igneous rock and transporting the igneous rock around. But in this playthrough, we really can't do any of that. Yeah, we could run a system using dupe only power to grab the igneous rock, but it's just not as fun when you're not using it for geothermal power. Because what the dupe only power does is just limits the amount of stuff that we can do in the playthrough. Because every colony that you go to, you have to bring extra dupes just to run on the dupe wheel. Which, it's completely doable, don't get me wrong. It just becomes a lesson in futility and grinding once you get teched up visiting all the planetoids. So it's like a similar series with just less interesting content. And I'm all about providing everyone the best content that we can deliver. And unfortunately, I don't think Dupe Only Power does that. Once we've set the Dupe Only Power system and shown how it works and gotten a colony reasonably supplied, everything else is just, well, not as interesting. But let me know in the comments below what you think. Are you excited about seeing a new Ani series and all the potential that it brings? Or would you rather see more episodes of Dupe Only Power? In this episode, we built the awesome, passively cooled, cool steam vent. We also got our sulfur requirements handled. All this sulfur is coming in and sitting in this little pool, and it's around 47 degrees. And then finally, we've got our orbital research going. With that being said, let me know in the comments below what direction you want to head into. New Ani series? Or... Continuing with the dupe only power. I had a great time in this episode. I hope you did too. Talk to you soon. <laughs>